Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear us all far flung around the world for this Zoom meeting. Um, I'm going to start this now. Uh, it's Andrew Harding here, by the way. I'm a BBC correspondent based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, it's my great pleasure to host the launch of a, or who knows, possibly the legal definition of ecocide. I'm sure most of you zooming in here today will know a little or maybe an awful lot about what prompted this push to define a new crime, to sit at the International Criminal Court alongside genocide and crimes against humanity. The bottom line, as far as I can see, is that the ICC is, has been understandably preoccupied with war, specifically war between humans. But the court ignores a far bigger conflict now raging between humans and our planet itself, hence the push to make ecocide much more than a catchy slogan. Since we gathered here on Zoom last December to unveil a high powered panel of international experts, those experts have been busy drafting and redrafting. And it seems to me the wider world has also begun hearing and discussing a good deal more about this topic. Today, we'll be hearing what the panel have come up with and what happens next. And we'll have plenty of time for questions. As usual, you can add them to the sidebar on this Zoom app. You can also vote for questions that you think should be pushed up to the top. So please keep an eye on that chat function, which I'm sure you're all very well aware of now. Um, up first today is Jojo Mehta, chair of the Stop Ecoside Foundation, the organization that brought this panel together in the first place, Jojo. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's fantastic to see so many people attending. The term ecocide is broadly understood as mass damage and destruction of ecosystems. The global conversation around it, and in particular, the conversation around criminalizing it, is growing fast. Our foundation is uniquely positioned in this conversation, bringing together, as we do, a long history of advocacy for recognition of ecocide at all levels, with particular emphasis on the International Criminal Court, as well as strategic support in this context for climate vulnerable island states, liaison with parliamentarians and government departments from multiple countries, and also collaboration with grassroots campaigns. Ours is the only organization with this exclusive positioning and focus. The global context for this conversation is no doubt clear to everyone. The UNFCCC's February report suggests that current emission reduction commitments will lead to only a tiny fraction of what is required by 2030 to meet the long-term temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. While island nations experience ever worsening weather events, extinction levels and habitat loss globally show frightening figures. And at the same time, those communities stewarding and standing up to protect the most biodiverse and climate crucial regions of the world are being persecuted. Without some kind of enforceable legal parameter addressing the root causes of these crises, it's hard to see how Paris targets and the UN SDGs can possibly be reached. Indeed, the science is now indicating that some tipping points are being approached and may already be irreversible. Antarctic ice loss, for example, or thawing permafrost. This is why making ecocide a crime is beginning to look less like an extreme measure and more like a necessary guardrail that could help steer our civilization back into a safe operating space. Governments, political actors and faith leaders across the globe are now beginning to seriously discuss this. At least, eight, at least eight ICC member states, as well as the Pope and the European Parliament, have already in various ways recorded an interest in discussion of amending the Rome Statute. Vanuatu, the Maldives, France, Belgium, Finland, Spain, Canada and Luxembourg. The Interparliamentary Union, comprising delegations from 179 parliaments around the world, has expressed in principle support for an international crime of ecocide in a virtually unanimous recent vote. Parliamentary motions or proposals of law have also been submitted in a number of individual countries, Belgium, Portugal, Sweden, Brazil, France, Bolivia. Criminalizing ecocide will signal a change in the ground rules by which the global economy operates. Acting as an enforceable deterrent and channeling finance away from practices that significantly destroy ecosystems. Of course, the corporate sector will require some time to adjust, 
And so addressing this internationally and collaboratively with full clarity on the implications of such an approaching law will be fundamentally important. Recognizing ecocide and hence requiring these adjustments to corporate practice will, we believe, have three important consequences. Firstly, that of protecting Earth's precious life support systems by making severe and reckless damage to nature illegal and therefore unlicensable and uninsurable. Secondly, it will stimulate innovation in a healthy direction in all sectors. Indeed, corporate leaders in many areas are actively calling for legislation that can level the playing field, allowing the many solutions which are available to grow and to replace destructive practices. For example, renewable energy, circular economy, regenerative agriculture, and so forth. Much of what we need to transition to a stable planet is already available to us, but is simply not adequately supported and practiced while the doors remain open to the old polluting ways. If those doors are closed, new ones will open, enabling the shift that we all know is needed. Thirdly, and importantly, Placing serious destruction of nature below the moral red line of criminal law has the power to strongly shift cultural assumptions, to shift our understanding of our place in the natural living world and our responsibility towards it, to help us to realize that we are not separate from the natural living world. We are embedded in it and part of it. And it may be that this, in the long term, is the most important effect of all. Last year, our foundation was approached by Swedish parliamentarians with a simple request. Could we commission a clear and credible legal definition of ecocide, which could be considered for possible proposal at the International Criminal Court? The independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide was convened in response. And today we're delighted to be presenting the results of its collaborative work over the last six months. We fully expect that attention from around the world will expand significantly as a result of this definition emerging, and that public interest and demand for this very concrete legal solution will steadily increase. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jojo. I, I don't know about you, but the word that stood out for me there was uninsurable, a, a word, a small word that I can imagine packs quite a potentially big punch. Um, next, we're going to hear from Diofal So from Dakar, Senegal. Um, she's a UN jurist, a former prosecutor, and co-chair of this Ecoside panel. Uh, Dior, c'est à vous. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Moderateur. Uh, je vais... Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I will try to briefly summarize the works of the group that took place over six months. I will not get back to the cause the reason why we have put together this panel, because Jojo reminded us of it. It's following the request of the Swedish parliament. After this request, the panel was put in place at the end of November. The expert group has a number of recognized personalities for their expertise in environmental rights and interesting topics linked to climate change. We should also highlight, and that's quite important, that we need to take into account the gender, which is the case in this panel. The group is also cosmopolitan and cross-disciplinary. And our mission was to draft a definition of ecocide as an international crime and insert it in the Rome Statutes. So I will talk about the composition of the group so we have Jojo Mehta from the United Kingdom, two co-chairs, Professor Philip Sands from the UK, and then Dior Falso from Senegal, Kate McIntosh from the US and the UK, Richard Rogers from the UK, and we had other experts, Valérie Caban from France, Paolo Farardo, Ecuador, Sieda Rizwana Hassan, Bangladesh, Charles Jallo, Sierra Leone, Florence Evenson, United Kingdom, Rodrigo Ledo, Chile, Christina Voig, Norway, Tuiloma Neroni Slade, 
Samoa, Alex, Whiting, United States. So you can see how cosmopolitan these experts were. The experts worked together for six months. They received long documentation with expert works with previous definitions. The group benefited from external experts as well. In February, there was the launch of a legal consultation with the opinion of various states, groups on various issues that were defined and that are in the definition. We had 402 answers that were received. The co-chairs and vice presidents met in January before the first plenary in order to get meet and to define the working modalities and their discussions put together an agenda and after the validation of all the members of the panel had five plenary sessions in January, March, April, May and June and each uh, plenary has a precise agenda between these plenaries and there are meetings with the co-chairs in order to see where we're at and how we will organize the next meetings. There were groups also that are in charge of various tasks in terms of drafting and research. The objective and the modality of the definition of this new crime was also defined during the plenary. We didn't want substantial modifications for the Rome Statute, but we wanted to suggest an amendment in order to complete the existing crimes and to add ecocide. Therefore, the group of experts had to define clearly and precisely, and with a good legal argumentation, the new crime that was to be added. Therefore, the group had to refer to the gains that we already had in international criminal law, and we needed to take into account all the guidance that we already had in the Rome Statute. And the first plenary meeting on the 19th meant that we were able to meet the members of the panel and we talked about the context that this work was done in. And we were able also to identify actions to put in place before the next plenary. During this plenary, the co-chairs and vice-chairs were to put together an initial text to send to all the panelists in order to get their comments. This meant that after the analysis of their comments, we could determine the essential points for the discussion in the next session. During this second session, the panelists reached a consensus regarding the amendments for the Statute of Rome, adding an amendment to A of the preamble and to modify Article 5 of the statute in order to introduce the eco seed crime and add Article 8 B to define ecocide as a crime. And four groups were created with a coordinator who accepted to summarize their group work. And for the plenary in May, to send concrete proposals regarding the definition of the terms and the modification of the definition that was suggested and the amendments to be done for the preamble. During the plenary, we were able to move forward and propose a better strategy in order to reach the objectives, in order to add ecocide as a crime. The last plenary in June meant that we were able to finalize the definition of the ecocide crime in highlighting the points of consensus and integrating some omissions and clarifying certain points. During this plenary, we have decided to put together a documentary, a commentary document that would go with the definition. So that was for the work of this panel. Thank you very much. Of the, the sense of urgency, um, of speed that 
this extraordinary panel has had to operate in. And I think that that reflects the urgency everyone feels about this issue. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we now turn to a man channeling the spirit of Diego, no, of Cristiano Ronaldo there by refusing to endorse uh, soft drinks and bringing in some, some water, I suspect, in the background there. Philippe Sands is next. He is the co-chair of this drafting panel, Professor of International Law at University College London. Um, over to you, Philippe. Thank you, uh, Andrew, and merci, uh, Dior. It's been uh, a real privilege you, to Dior. work uh, with Stop Ecoside on this interesting and I hope important uh, project. Um, Dior has described our working methods, who we are, how we went about things. Uh, it is an extraordinarily di diverse uh, group, which I think is uh, uh, part of the strength. We've got everyone from former prosecutors and even a judge, former judge at the International Criminal Court, to people who are on the ground in places like Ecuador and elsewhere, and a whole raft of people um, in the middle. And it's a real um, happiness, therefore, that we were able to conclude on a consensus basis. The text that has been distributed, the text that you have, is one that we have all uh, subscribed to. Uh, we have taken into account each other's views, We've taken into account the views of the consultation. Dior mentioned the hundreds of documents that we received from people all over the world that was paid very great attention to. How did we go about uh, the working? I have to say that I've been particularly influenced by my own background in this exercise. I was in Rome in uh, July, 1998. Uh, I was a member of a South Pacific Island uh, delegation uh, working um, closely with my colleague Andrew Clapham. We were actually responsible for drafting uh, the preamble. So I'm acutely aware uh, that back then that the idea of ecocide was raised. It was not ripe uh, for inclusion. Uh, states back then decided they wanted to stick with the existing international crimes. And there are four of them. Uh, war crimes, most long established in international law, and then three new crimes, which were basically created in 1945, the crime of aggression, as it's called today, crimes against humanity and genocide. And there have been no new international crimes since 1945. That doesn't mean, of course, that the objective of protecting the environment is absent from international criminal law. It's not. It finds its place, particularly um, in the rules on war crimes. And one thing uh, to make very clear at the outset, and I'm going to take you very briefly through uh, the definition that we've come up with, is we have been able to base the definition that we have taken on existing precedents in international criminal law and in international law uh, generally. In other words, we're able to point to literally every word in the text and say there is authority for that, there is a basis for that. The innovation and the originality of this exercise uh, has been the bringing together of different parts of the law, but it is grounded on what has already passed. And I think that that's been influenced in part by the work that took place in 1945, that remarkable moment between the end of the war and the adoption of the Nuremberg Statute when new crimes were drafted and included. And the drafters of those crimes of whom I've written uh, in a book I published four or five years ago, Hirsch Lauterpacht, Raphael Lemkin, assisted by a raft of other individuals, similarly went through the exercise, having recognized that new situations require new crimes of nevertheless grounding their work in what had come before to make it easier to move to their adoption. I'm myself a practicing barrister. I do cases at the International Criminal Court at the International Court of Justice. My own background was originally in international environmental law. Uh, you could say that my entire career was uh, catalyzed by the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in April 1986, which caused me to go off in the direction of international environmental law. And having worked in that field very happily for about a decade, I then moved into the fields of international criminal law and in particular, as many of you will know from my writings and the cases that I've done, crimes against humanity and genocide. So it's sort of 
a melding uh, of all these activities and a melding that takes into account the work of others who have come before us. Um, the words of former Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme when he introduced the Stockholm Conference in 1972, the first UN effort to deal with the environment when he invoked ecocide. The words of Ben Whitaker uh, in his work for uh, minority groups uh, in the 1980s. And then uh, much more recently, the work of renowned jurists like uh, Richard Falk, and then more recently, um, the English barrister, the late English barrister, Polly Higgins, uh, to whom we uh, dedicate the work that we have done and who's done so much uh, to push this agenda in the period before her untimely and tragic death. And then at a very personal note uh, for me, as he passed away just a couple of weeks ago, my mentor, my colleague, my friend, Judge James Crawford uh, of the International Court of Justice, a wonderful Australian jurist, uh, we argued the first cases on the environment before the International Court of Justice, and uh, to him also, this work is dedicated. Uh, going back in time, uh, one of the great law review articles I uh, read uh, back in my days as a student of international law in the 1980s was by a man called Christopher Stone, who we've also just recently lost in the last uh, few weeks. He published in 1972 a law review article in the University of Southern California Law Review with a great title, Should Trees Have Standing? This was now 50 years ago, um, and it was revolutionary at its time, and into a sense, it's still revolutionary today because it posited the idea of rights for natural objects, that we ought to be able to use the law, domestic law and international law, to protect our natural environment. And the work of Ecoside takes that idea forward. The four existing international crimes are all focused on the well-being of the human, individuals and groups in times of war and in times of peace, and rightly so. Uh, we don't in any way uh, wish to diminish those vastly important crimes. But what is missing is a place for our natural world. None of the existing international criminal laws protect the environment as an end in itself. And that's what the crime of ecocide does. Yes, it's intended to protect us as human beings, inhabitants of this planet, but it goes further than that. It's not only anthropocentric, it's also ecocentric. It's also intended to focus on the well-being of the planet, the well-being of our ecosystems, the well-being of the earth system. So I'm not starry-eyed about the law or international criminal law. I've done enough cases on crimes against humanity and genocide to understand that the mere adoption of a text does not stop horrors from occurring. But what it does is it changes consciousness. And that's why this initiative from Stop Ecocide, supported by various foundations, is so important. It causes us to think about the world differently, and it causes us to think about our place in the world differently. And it causes us to imagine the possibility the law could be used to protect the global environment, a time of real challenges in terms of our climate system, in terms of biodiversity, and in terms of so much more. And that's what I think is significant about this moment. It's about recognizing in this terrible moment of the pandemic, COVID-19, that we are not capable of controlling everything and we have to steward our natural world with care. So against that background, let's turn briefly to the text to give you a sense of the understanding. We've balanced, it's a balanced group, and we've balanced between wanting to go far and wanting to be pragmatic. We wanted to come up with a text that states could conceivably live with. And the initial reactions from those states we have shared it with has been immensely positive. The states that have participated with us informally have recognized that the text that we've come up with is grounded in the language of the statute of the International Criminal Court. It is the kind of text that states could run with if there is the political will to integrate the well-being of the environment into the statute of the International Criminal Court. And we've drafted it for that purpose, not as a freestanding text, but as a text that could be integrated or amended to be integrated into an amended Rome statute of the International Criminal Court. So Jojo, if we could begin by just bringing up a part of the text, just explain how we have um, balanced um, matters. 
And we focused on um, a text which looks first at what the lawyers like to call in Latin parlance, the mens rea. What's the intent? What's the mental element? And you will commit ecocide on our definition if you act in the knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood that your actions or your omissions will cause severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment. Uh, and that is a definition on mental intent that is firmly grounded in the statute of the International Criminal Court. If we could come to the next slide, please. Thank you, Jojo. This is the essence of what would be the new Article 8 ter after the definition of the crime of aggression. And I'm going to read it slowly. Ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. That text is taken from existing elements of the ICC statute and other international criminal laws. It will look rather familiar to many people who are grounded in this field. Let me take you briefly through the um, elements of the definition. What do we mean by severe? Uh, severe means damage which involves very serious adverse changes disruption or harm to any element of the environment, including grave impacts on human life or natural, cultural or economic resources. What we're concerned with here is setting the bar reasonably high. This is the International Criminal Court. National courts and national legal systems to build on this with their own definitions, but we're conscious. International Criminal Court, in application of the principle of complementarity, is a court of last resort. So this is not about catching every single horror that occurs in relation to the environment, but those horrors that cross a threshold and are of international concern, of international interest. So serious adverse changes, severe damage is what we are concerned with. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jojo. Every act which causes severe damage is capable of being ecocide. But it must also have a further element. It must be either widespread in its effect or long term. And this is based also on an existing war crimes definition, a 1977 convention. It is a disjunctive set of elements, widespread means damage beyond a limited geographic area, or which crosses state boundaries, or which is suffered by an entire ecosystem or species, or a large number of human beings. So it's a sort of territorial geographic element. And the alternative is a temporal element. Long term means damage which is irreversible, or which cannot be redressed through natural recovery within a reasonable period of time. So severe and widespread or severe and long-term is um, the requirement. And this temporal element allows us to catch, for example, if a species was considered to be of such singular importance, but nevertheless located within a single country or in even a tiny national geographic area, it could be considered to be significant enough to be caught by the definition of ecocide. If we could have the next slide, please. Uh, Jojo. We have also come up with a definition of the environment. This is a delicate matter. We know that the International Law Commission in a parallel exercise has decided to avoid a definition of the environment, and we've just drawn from existing international conventions with a simple definition that takes the five different elements uh, of Earth, biosphere, cryosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere, as well as outer space itself. And then the next text, please, Jojo. Finally, we've set a double threshold in terms of the nature of the acts. Not only must there be severe and widespread or long-term damage, 
the acts must also be either unlawful or wanton. And again, that is taken from the text of different parts of the ICC statute. I, I, unlawful could refer to either domestic law or it could refer to international law. The next slide, please, Jojo. And wanton uh, is the circumstance where it's not necessarily unlawful under uh, domestic law uh, or international law, an act which is engaged with reckless disregard for damage, which would be clearly excessive in relation to social and economic benefits anticipated. There's again a cost benefit analysis for acts which have uh, severe deleterious uh, effects, um, but which one would have to go through a balancing exercise. Here is the reality of the situation. A lot of acts are harmful to the environment. And in order to come within this definition, we have to be pragmatic and recognize that we cannot cover every single one of those acts. That is not for this definition uh, as a matter of international law. The definition has to have a number of thresholds and the determination of whether those thresholds uh, has been crossed will first and foremost, assuming a text of this kind is to be adopted, will be for a prosecutor at the International Criminal Court to form a view as to whether the requisite conditions are met. And having formed a view, she or he or they will then have to determine whether they can persuade a panel of three judges at the International Criminal Court, whether or not the crime of ecocide has happened. We have chosen the path of not listing particular acts. And a number of people will no doubt ask the question of why. And the reason for that is very simple. I know from my experience working in international law for more than 30 years, including international criminal law, that when you try to list a series of things to include in a text, you inevitably leave certain things out. And in leaving those things out, you signal that they are permissible or they may not be caught by the definition that you come up with. And we felt at the end of the day that a group of 12, indeed no reasonable group, I think would be able to come up with a list which was completely comprehensive and covered every situation. It will have to be for the prosecutor and the judges to form a view as to whether particular acts are or are not within the definitions, do or do not cross the thresholds. The other reality, of course, is a political one. If you start listing particular acts, you automatically create a situation in which those countries or groups or individuals who are involved in particular acts are going to think, oh, this is targeting me. And we felt that it was best to keep that door shut. We do not have here in mind any particular acts. We have looked as a group of lawyers at the consequences of certain acts and carved out a definition which looks at those consequences rather than uh, the label to be put on the act itself. But it may well be uh, that we can address these issues um, in subsequent questions. Um, by way of conclusion, this is a crime of endangerment. You don't actually, on this definition, in accordance with existing international criminal law necessarily have to show that actual harm has occurred. It may well be that in some cases harm will have occurred and that that will give rise to an investigation by a prosecutor and action by the judges. But if a law is to be effective, whether it is genocide, whether it's crimes against humanity, whether it's war crimes, it must also be possible to allow the law to fulfill a preventive function, to stop things from happening before they have actually occurred. And this definition that we've come up with is therefore inscribed in that long established principle of international criminal law. Final couple of points. Firstly, in the ICC statute, the only people who can be targeted, indicted, investigated are individuals. The International Criminal Court cannot bring actions against states or corporations or NGOs, although it can bring actions against individuals who are associated 
with states or corporations or NGOs or other groups. But the only people who can be defendants at the ICC is the individual. And that remains the position in relation to the definition that we have taken. And the final and concluding point is we've come up with a definition which we think could work. But ultimately, of course, it will be for states to decide whether they wish to proceed in this direction or a related direction or in another direction or not to proceed at all. And that's a matter of political will. My own sense is that we are now at a point where the support for such an initiative seems to be widespread and growing. I've been amazed by the requests that have come in um, for interviews, for example, from newspapers, magazines, and media outlets that are not seen as particularly progressive. And yet who recognize that something is going on on the state of our planet, which requires the instrumentality of the law to be brought to bear alongside other instrumentalities, political means, diplomatic means, economic means, social pressures. The law is but one instrument to be used, but it can be a powerful instrument. And it's to that end that we have adopted this definition and commend it to states for their consideration for possible inclusion in the statute of the International Criminal Court. Thank you so much, Andrew, and back to you. Many thanks, Philippe. Um, a bit of housekeeping now as we move on to the uh, Q&A section of this. First of all, can you please submit any questions in the Q&A section, not in the chat room um, on this Zoom app? Also, could you please, if you are asking a question in uh, French or Spanish, I've seen a few, just to speed things up and to, I suppose, imp improve your chances of getting uh, other people backing it, if you could use Google Translate or something to translate that into English, I think that may help, uh, certainly might help me uh, on, on the Spanish front. Um, and also do remember to, to vote for questions, to push them up the rankings, if you like, to get them near the top. Uh, Philippe, I think we'll give you a, a chance to take a break for a few seconds. I, I did want to just start by asking uh, Jojo about the logistics of pushing this forward. It was mentioned that eight countries and the Pope have already seen this and given their endorsement to, to this process and to what you've come up with. And I wondered whether you could explain the status of this draft, of this document, where it's going now and what sort of sense of urgency you're picking up from other states. In other words, could we see this realistically on the ICC statutes in a matter of years, months? What's your sense at this stage? Thank you so much um, for that question. Um, and I hope I'm, I'm popping up and, and visible again as I speak. Thank you. Um, yes, there have been previous amendments to the Rome Statute that have taken between two and seven to ten years to adopt. Um, the crime of aggression was the, was the only other time that a standalone crime was adopted uh, as an amendment into the Rome Statute. Now, we've been hearing from so many different directions that this is the decisive decade for taking action on climate and, and ecological crisis. And so we believe that actually the both the literal climate and the political climate, which is rapidly changing and taking notice, waking up to the situation that we're in, we believe that this could actually be more rapid than that. I mean, we make a, an estimate of, of four to five years, but um, we also have to say that in the last couple of years, developments have happened faster, not slower than we anticipated. Um, and this conversation is growing extremely fast. Um, and as Philippe says, we We've also had very initial positive responses, um, both from states and also from others in, for example, the corporate sector and the NGO world. So we're really um, expecting this to, to move quite fast. Well, thank you. Um, this is for, I think, Dior or Philippe. Um, I'm just going to offer a couple of short questions here that I think are quite pertinent. Um, one is, um, will there be retroactivity or a statute and or a statute of limitations assuming this law is adopted by the ICC. Um, and also, this is from Christian Stahlberg, doesn't ecocide law already exist in any nation currently? Uh, and if so, which? Uh, 
Um, um, Philip, I, perhaps I, we could start with you. Or, or Georgia. You're, you're I mean, I, I was just going to drop in with the uh, already existing ecocide laws. There are 10 states that have uh, ecocide in some form in their in their current legislation, but uh, that have that have been quite underused. Um, you know, we don't know of significant cases, and and quite a few of those are former Soviet countries um, that have perhaps had more pressing legal issues on their minds than uh, working towards. Um, responding to uh, situations of ecocide. Um, we also think that the uh, expansion of this conversation onto the international stage is actually hugely significant here because um, countries uh, on their own are often a little wary, governments on their own, of, of being the first on the block, if you like, with this sort of new wave of, mo of moving into this, um, because of either because of established economic relationships or, you know, the, the rapid change that might be needed. But approaching this at the international level has a way of creating a kind of a time frame and having people see this coming over the horizon and and therefore being able to potentially start addressing things like transition policies um, and compliance pathways and so on. So yeah, that, I think that's that's uh, probably all I need to say on that particular issue, but perhaps Philippe could address the other side, the rest retrospectivity side. Well, uh, Andrew, um, <laughs> we're all acutely aware of the reactions of various characters who sat in the dock when the Nuremberg trial opened on the 20th of November 1945 and they read or were read out in court in famous courtroom 600 crimes like genocide and crimes against humanity which did not exist when they got up to their mischief um, in the late 1930s uh, onwards. The basic principle in international law in relation to the criminal law is non-retroactivity. It does not apply to acts that occurred prior to um, the text being uh, adopted and implemented by states. But of course, with environmental issues, you do have a particular characteristic, which is the notion of the continuing crime, um, whether it's emissions into the marine environment or the atmosphere, they may start on day one, they may be continuing 600 days later, uh, adding to the mischief that is being caused. And so in the environmental context, the key point will be the date on which any text comes into force. And a crime that is occurring at that point, including one that may have been commenced prior to the statute having been amended, could in principle be caught. But an act which occurred only prior to the statute uh, having come uh, into force and which did not have continuing effects uh, would not be caught. Thank you, Philippe. Um, we have a ton of questions pouring in, which is great, and, and a huge number of people in attendance. Um, let me start now with uh, some here in the Q&A. To what extent does recourse to the ICC require that possibilities for use of domestic legal systems have been exhausted? Uh, the person Flavio Montiel cites Brazil where domestic lawsuits may be stalled for years. I mean, the test in, in the ICC is whether, uh, well, the starting point is there is a principle in the ICC statute of complementarity. It, 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 and it basically evokes the idea that the ICC is a place of last resort, so that national legal systems must have an opportunity to address a particular action's potential criminality. And if a state is unwilling or unable to give effect to its domestic law to achieve the protection required by the ICC statute, then and only then can the International Criminal Court step in. Uh, and that is a principle, of course, that would continue to apply. One of the things that's interesting, and it's come up, I've noticed in some of the questions, is how this relates to various initiatives at the national level for criminalizing harm to the environment. Um, many, many, many countries criminalize certain environmental harms already. Uh, I'm speaking from the United Kingdom, uh, that is established in English law. They don't call it ecocide, 
but if I you know, cause massive damage to some environmental resource, I may well commit uh, a, a crime. Some countries are also considering adopting national laws on ecocide. Bangladesh, right today, this week, is considering that. France uh, is considering that. But if a crime of ecocide were to be integrated into the statute of the International Criminal Court, then every state party which accepted that amendment would have an obligation to implement the crime of ecocide into their domestic law. And that's precisely to give effect to the principle of complementarity. When the United Kingdom became a party to the statute of the International Criminal Court, it had to amend its domestic law to implement the crimes of genocide and crimes against humanity. And the same principle exactly would apply. So it's a sort of fast track way uh, of um, transposing uh, the crime of ecocide, not only at the international level, but hopefully into many domestic national legal systems. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Do please all remember to vote for your favorite questions. There are so many coming through. I think we may have some issues with that voting system. Um, if that's the case, I apologize. Um, but in the meantime, um, here's a general question, and Dior, it might be something for you as well. Um, what are the main objections that you foresee coming from member states, and, and how do you intend to see off those objections? And also, just for my sake, a stupid question, what is the, the, the number of states you need in order for this to proceed? Why don't we start with you? Oh, you it's still muted. Have we have we lost uh, have we lost Dior? We have at the moment. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not sure quite what has happened there. Um, in relation to um, the number of states, the ICC uh, has a provision uh, in its statute which requires um, a, a matter to be raised at the Assembly of State Parties by a relatively small number of states. I don't know what the exact number is, but it, you don't need a huge number uh, to basically put the matter on the agenda. What you then do need is a significant enough number, I can't remember what the number is precisely, uh, to take the matter forward. Jojo looks like she can answer <laughs> Uh, that question, I haven't done my homework uh, closely <laughs> enough. Over to you, Jojo. Yeah, I can certainly answer that one because we get asked that all the time. Um, so uh, the, the Rome Statute sets out a particular amendment procedure um, whereby uh, any, any state can propose an amendment um, and to sort of get it in under discussion requires a simple majority. Um, to move it forward to adoption into the statute, um, one needs a minimum of two thirds of the state, the member states. And currently there are 123 member states. So you would need at least 82 states to be behind this, which is quite a large number. On the other hand, one of the beauties of the ICC is, is like the UN, it's a one state, one vote situation. So those states can be any sovereign state. Um, and, you know, for example, Vanuatu, which was the first country to bring this up at the International Criminal Court in 2019 and suggest it should be seriously considered, um, has just as much right um, and just as much vote as any of the other larger economies, for example, which, which are members. Um, so, so that's encouraging. The other thing that's also quite exciting is that unlike the UN, there isn't a Security Council. So there's no um, sort of small group of countries that has a veto. It doesn't work like that. So there is actually the sort of exciting possibility of, of, of moving things forward in a, in a perhaps a more rapid way than might, uh, might take place at the UN. Great. Can you hear me? The um, power has just gone off here in Khartoum, so I've had to switch very rapidly between my laptop and, uh, and 4G, but um, uh, these are the struggles in, in a country that is, well, hopefully on the mend, but is still facing some big challenges. Um, here, though, I see, um, thanks to WhatsApp, uh, some questions coming in. How quickly do you think this could take place? Uh, I know you touched on this, Jojo, um, and will it be fast enough to actually shift the needle on catastrophic climate change, or is it simply too late? 
Well, I, I'd yeah. love to jump in there and say I, I never think it's too late. I think if, you know, we, we certainly uh, we, we, we've been told that this decade is a decisive decade. We still have nine years left of this decade. That's plenty of time to act. Um, and, you know, it's I think that the way that uh, things manifest in this world is through intention um, and the the positive and optimistic attitude around this is far more likely to materialize it than assuming it's too late. Um, I think that's a that's a sort of pessimistic story of giving up, which we simply sh shouldn't and can't afford to do. Uh, I don't know whether Philippe or Dior would like to come in on um, the attitude there. I think Dior has a hand up. To you, Dior. Say vous. Over oui, to oui. you, Dior. Yes, I had raised my hand. Sorry, I got disconnected at some point. We wanted to see how things would evolve, how quickly would things would move forward. I think Jojo answered when I, I was going to say we needed two thirds of the member states for it to be approved. And I think indeed we can't really know how long it will take, how many years it will take, but we can hope that it will happen a lot quicker than for crimes of aggression. And we realize that in, in the current context, these issues, environmental issues, are more and more important. And Jojo was also saying we need 82 members in order to proceed, but we can have help from some of the countries from island states, which are quite important, I believe. And it depends on our ability to persuade. And I think these states are very important and we need to have a strategy to see which countries could quickly bring their support. And we can also have hope because we realize indeed this idea of ecocide as a crime. It's not the first time that it's been mentioned. We talked about it during the Statute of Rome, this Rome Statute, and some countries didn't allow this crime to be part of international crimes. And now we make sure that it is in the Rome Statute. So I think we have reasons to hope it won't happen tomorrow, but perhaps it'll take less time than we think. I think we are convinced that it is a crime. If this damage is still being caused to our planet where people are living, I believe we have a good reason to continue this battle. It's a question of survival for our planet. So I have a lot of hope that this ecocide crime will be part of the Rome Statute for the survival of our planet. I mean, I mean, just on this, I mean, if, if there's political will, there's no reason why this can't happen very, very quickly. If there's no political will, it will take more time. But I want to jump to a question that is of interest to me because it was at the heart really of many of our discussions, but it's not explicitly addressed. And that's a question from Fahana Yamin uh, on climate damage, which she writes is happening due to past emissions. Uh, that of course is correct, largely and disproportionately from developed countries and from, as she writes, less than a hundred fossil fuel companies. How does this proposed definition take that reality into account? And th this is a really complex and delicate issue. Is climate change potentially caught uh, by this definition? And the answer to that is, of course, yes, it is. But here is the difficulty. Each and every one of us on this call contributes to climate change. I contribute to climate change. I contribute to climate change in my daily life by emitting uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. They're, my emissions probably on their own could not be characterized as severe. I probably also contribute to climate change in some of my professional activities. If I'm advising on a boundary dispute between two countries, uh, the resolution of which is motivated by desire to extract oil and gas from below the sea, it could be said rightly, I think, that I am in some way 
uh, contributing to climate change. Is that a criminal act? Well, it might be, um, depending on the, the nature uh, of the uh, projects that are being um, envisaged. But the key, I think, to dealing with this is to uh, the part of the definition where we're looking at acts which are going to have severe, yes, climate change is obviously looking like it's going to be severe if it's not severe already, uh, widespread, yes, uh, long-term, yes, unlawful, well, that becomes more complex, wanton is probably, I think, the key to the answer to this question. So I think if a corporate actor, if a state, if an individual is going to engage in the authorization or the promotion of a project in wanton disregard of the effects on the environment without taking into account at all the economic and social benefits or deciding um, in a ridiculous manner that the environmental harm somehow is outweighed by the economic and social benefits. In those circumstances, one could imagine um, activities which could fall within the characteristics. So um, again, I'm loath to mention any particular examples, but the authorization, for example, in an industrialized country of a massive new coal field and a massive new coal-fired power plants without properly or at all taking into regard the impacts on the climate system, I think could arguably come within this definition. And one can think of a raft of other acts in relation to deforestation, in relation to oil spills, in relation to oil and gas exploration, which over time could clearly be seen as coming within this definition. But Fahana's question is a very important one, and it pinpoints the complexities of coming up with a definition that is both effective, but also realistic in recognizing the different needs of different countries. And that is a real problem and challenge that we must not run away from. Well, thank you for bringing it to some concrete examples, because I know that came up in December. Uh, people wanting to say, well, what are your first cases likely to be? And obviously now we have this definition. I wonder the extent to which that has evolved in the thinking on that. But um, on that front, I've got a question here from Matthew Bird saying, um, does the damage need to be financial or can it be intangible? Um, this is a very personal question to different members of the group. I let Dior uh, answer momentarily. But for me, I've often had in mind um, the example of, um, you know, the last two white rhinoceroses or something. If someone, you know, then decides they want those white rhinoceroses or the last coral reef in the Indian Ocean or whatever, and is uh, engaged in a wanton act of destruction for no social, environmental, economic or other benefit, but wanton destruction, to my mind, that could be the crime of ecocide, just as the destruction of statues in Mali recently by the International Criminal Court was considered to be a war crime. In other words, the answer is no. We're not looking out and we are not interested in measuring the financial consequences or the economic damage. But Dior may well have her own answer. Mine is a very personal answer. Dior, would you like to jump in there? Vous voulez parler sur ce thème? Dior? I completely agree with Philip's point of view personally as well. The American role, and Dior, you were touching on this on the number of countries supporting uh, this move. Given that the US does not recognize the ICC, how effective can such a law be in reining in the environmental harms done by America and American corporations? And by extension, I think this is another issue that's come up. How do you personalize these issues when it seems that you have corporations and governments guilty? How do you then drill down to an individual as it seems you must? Should I answer the question? Hello? 
I wanted to speak about the states. There is a process to amend the statute, and the states, what they can do, well, they can not accept, but they can't impose a veto. So I think there are very specific rules. Now, the second question is not something that I really understood very well. Individualize, how to drill down to an individual uh, rather than a government or a, a, an organization. Well, well, I mean, on on I mean, on that question, we, we've got we've got experience of it because you know the defendants who were in the dock at Nuremberg, the first ever international criminal trial, um, and all roads lead to Nuremberg. Let us not forget that uh, October the first this year is the seventy fifth anniversary of the Nuremberg trial. So, what better moment than to catalyze the adoption of the fifth crime? Uh, ecocide. It's extremely timely. But those individuals who were there, Hans Frank, Hermann Goering, and others, they were there not because they'd been off on a frolic on their own devices. They'd been acting for a state. They were all in senior government positions. And ecocide would act in exactly the same way. A chief executive of a corporation, a minister of finance, or a prime minister, or a president who pushes the button and authorizes a project, absolutely, they could be caught. But you asked another question that I find also very fascinating. Um, and that is what about states that are not parties? And this, of course, right now is a real live issue in the life of the International Criminal Court. We have cases before the International Criminal Court in which the ICC has given authority to the prosecutor to investigate crimes committed on the territory of Bangladesh and Myanmar in relation to the Rohingya community. Myanmar is not a party, but the effects of its actions are said to be felt on the territory of a state party, Bangladesh. Similarly, in relation to Palestine and Israel. Palestine is a party to the ICC statute. Israel is not. The actions of Israel are said to be felt on the territory of Palestine. And that brings the matter, according to the judges, within the jurisdiction of the court. What that means is that an act authorized in the territory of a country that is not a party to the ICC statute, but the consequences of which are felt on the environment of a state party, would fall within the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And of course, that opens the door to potential effectiveness, but it also opens the door to potential political difficulties. And that reality is something I think we in the group were all acutely conscious of. Jojo, maybe this is for you. Uh, somebody asked earlier about uh, Africa, a uh, continent likely to be hit hardest by climate change, um, but also a continent that has its own problematic relationship with the ICC. Um, and we've seen that your panel very diverse, but I wondered what sort of engagement and what sort of enthusiasm you're getting from African leaders um, regarding this and the potential, I suppose. I think we've we lost that. We've lost, we've temporarily yeah. lost Andrew. You'll need to take over Jojo. <laughs> Yeah, we, we have indeed temporarily lost Andrew. Uh, the connection in Khartoum is clearly not as reliable as uh, it may perhaps be in other places somewhere. Um, so, of course, the diplomatic um, kind of progress of what we're doing um, is is not of course, but I can certainly say that it's further advanced than it may look publicly, but we actually have to be quite reserved about what we say about that for obvious reasons in the sense that, you know, if, if a state is, is, um, is talking about this, it's not 
it's not our position to be able to say that until they are ready to say that. Um, and a, a simple example of that is, is that, you know, we worked for quite a long time with, um, with Vanuatu um, and supporting them strategically, helping them be able to have a voice at the ICC, because of course, if you're on a, a little Pacific island um, and coming over to The Hague, uh, that's an incredibly, you know, that's an expensive endeavor. Whereas of course, you know, if you're in Europe, then reaching The Hague is easy. And this is another, re you know, another, uh, sort of thing that gets leveled at the ICC effectively that, that in itself it, it is part of a system that is sort of dominated in in sort of Western Europe or you know the sort of colonial um, sort of structure if you like so part of the the sort of support in the background was simply enabling those voices to be heard at that table um, and and that is going to be true of, of, of certain aspects various countries around the world um, but I think it's also worth noticing that the potential of a crime of ecocide is kind of interesting in comparison to, say, the situation with war crimes or, um, or, or say, genocide, in the sense that the effects of ecocide are felt very much in the, in the global south, but the decisions that lead to those effects are often taken in the wealthy north um, and this crime of course aims at those decision key decision makers so there is in a way a sort of a potential for a rebalancing one could say um, of that dynamic via this crime and i think it's also worth picking up a little bit on what's been covered slightly and um, which is looking at the the sort of corporate versus the individual because uh, at the moment um corporations have uh, you know they, they might pay i mean expensive lawyers to work around current regulations potentially um or also you know budget for court cases um what we end up with with a criminal situation where there is the personal freedom of a single individual on the line is that as as, as i've heard philippe say a number of times it does concentrate the mind effectively you know it does have those individuals rather than their due diligence going in the direction of how do we work around a very detailed piece of regulation that due diligence may well now start going towards instead how can we make sure that we don't fall foul of this new rule because you know my personal freedom is going to be on the line and and that has a real potential for um carrying weight in the corporate arena, which is which is where um, most e ecocidal activity is, is, is taking place, because, of course, unlike, well, no, I mean, I don't know any genocidal maniacs, so I don't know what an average genocidal maniac or if there is such a thing, but I'm sure they're not so worried about their PR as a CEO. So if you imagine, um, you know, a, a, the corporate um, credibility, the investor confidence, the share price and so on, depend very heavily on reputation. And so for a, a key decision maker in a company, um, being sort of thought of alongside a war criminal or, 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 or someone committing genocide is, is, is not appealing at all, because it, it can drastically affect the, the, su the success of the business venture. And so there's a potential, there's a deterrent potential with ecocide as a crime that may even be more powerful in, in its area than than war crimes uh, i'm back by the way uh, thanks for helping me out there i'm not sure whether you or your colleagues had a chance to address that question about africa and the extent to which africa is involved and and how they are receiving that uh, this this suggestion uh, of uh, what you've come up with yeah, I, I did actually cover that um, in, okay. in, in my response, yeah, uh, in, in general. Terms. Okay. <laughs> um, Philippe, I know you've talked a lot about the lessons learned from, uh, from crimes against humanity and genocide um, and the effectiveness of having a broader target as opposed to the more individual. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you've borrowed or incorporated from those two key crimes in what you've tried to do with this, what your team, the panel has tried to do in, in drafting this? Sure. I mean, you know, starting in 2010, I did a deep dive into the lives of the two men who created the terms crimes against humanity and genocide in international law. And it was a remarkable experience because I learned how quickly it was done, the interplay between ideas conjured by Hirsch Lauterpacht and Raphael Lemkin, the way they went about 
gaining traction through the support of states and um, the way the media, you know, your organization, Andrew, and institutions large and small from the New York Times to the Hampstead and Highgate Express, where I live in Camden Town in London, or the Guardian or Le Monde or whatever, can play an absolutely huge role in changing public consciousness. It's a collective effort. But the essence of the work of Lauterpacht and Lemkin was in different directions. Crimes Against Humanity is about the protection of individuals. Genocide is about the protection of groups. One of the things we've all come to appreciate is that somehow genocide has come to be seen wrongly, in my view, as the crime of crimes. It's the one when mentioned by a president of the United States makes it onto the front pages of every newspaper in the world. If President Biden says this is a genocide, it'll be in our papers on page one. If he says it's a crime against humanity, no one pays any attention or a war crime. But that seems to be a reality. It's a complex reality. I don't know exactly what the reason for that is. And in crafting our definition, we've tried to take the best of the definitions of genocide and crimes against humanity. Of course, the word ecocide mirrors Raphael Lemkin's invention in the autumn of 1944. He literally invented the word um, from a Latin word and a Greek word, um, genus and sede, and ecocide draws on that and is inspired by that approach. But the core of the crime of ecocide owes more to crimes against humanity. And I have to say it must do so because the threshold of the definition of genocide in international law, as I'm acutely aware from the cases I've been involved in, sets a very, very high threshold. You have to show an intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. And if we were to take that definition on ecocide, the intention to destroy the environment in whole or in part, there would never be any ecocide because those who perpetrate massive horrors against the environment uh, do not do so with the intention, or certainly not the sole intention, of destroying the environment. And so, in essence, the definition we have come up with takes from the approach of genocide and the approach of crimes against humanity with a bit of war crimes definition sprinkled in for good measure. And we hope that that approach comes up with something which is potentially effective, but not, if you like, so widespread in its effects that states run away and throw their arms up in horror. You know, quite recently, French President Macron announced that he supported uh, the crime of ecocide, but it was pretty apparent that he hadn't possibly fully reflected on what he meant by it. And he set up a commission which has struggled in French domestic law to put flesh on the idea that he plainly supports. And it's against that background that we've tried, I think, with a deep dive into the uh, international crimes that already exist, come up, try to come up with something that takes the best from um, uh, existing international crimes without setting the bar too low um, and frightening states who we need to adopt the definition or setting the bar so high that it becomes effectively useless in practice. And that's a very tricky balancing act and time will tell whether we've got it right or wrong. But the test, of course, ultimately is whether states feel willing to support this initiative. And it'll be a matter of watch this space, whether we've got it right or wrong. Okay, thank you. Um, on housekeeping again, if people could keep voting for their favorite questions. I think a lot of the top ones we've started to, to answer now. Here's one from Lily Fur. How do you prove causality and damage in the case of climate change, where the cause is very local? Um, for instance, extracting and burning fossil fuels, but the effects are very global and diverse. We often see climate change interacting with other crises. How can criminal law and this definition help here? Philippe, perhaps one for you again. Well, uh, you know, um, I, I think that 
uh, the criminal law um, helps to form our sense of consciousness of what is right and what is wrong. Um, and it helps to define the elements. Um, but it is never going to be a panacea of itself. Uh, I think Polly Higgins, who did so much uh, to push this idea in the last 10 years of her life, was acutely conscious that the exercise she was engaged in was intended to help us rethink our relationship to the natural world. And I think that is the central role that the law uh, can play. I mean, let, let me give an example of, of, of how the law changes consciousness. You know, a few, uh, well, about a year and a half ago, I, I, I argued the case before the International Court of Justice for the Gambia against Myanmar uh, on the allegation that Myanmar was engaged in a genocide against the Rohingya. And a few days before the um, hearings in The Hague, I was in Washington at a seminar at George Washington University on a panel with a very good friend of mine, um, Judge Thomas Bergenthal, who used to be the American judge at the International Court of Justice. And he was very interested in this case being brought at the International Court of Justice in relation to uh, genocide uh, concerning the Rohingya community. One of the things that people will not know about Thomas Bergenthal, although they might want to read his remarkable book, A Lucky Child, was that in 1944, he was in Auschwitz. He was in the charge of a man called Joseph Mengele. He was one of the children who Mengele uh, tried to do experiments on. And Tom Bergenthal said to me that day in November 2019, can you imagine if in 1944, when I was at Auschwitz, there had been a piece of paper which said, genocide is a crime and you can't engage in it. And if there'd been an international court which had jurisdiction over that crime, and if a faraway country brought proceedings against Germany, can you imagine? It was unimaginable that anyone then in 44, and what Raphael Lemkin did in 1945 with his definition of genocide and Lauterpacht with his definition of crimes against humanity was to change the world by allowing a piece of papers to be written which said, this is a line that cannot be crossed. Yes, it will be crossed in certain circumstances, but as a matter of law, it cannot be crossed. And if you cross it, you will be committing an international crime. And that I think is the precedent that I have in mind, that Dior has in mind, that our panel members have in mind. We're not starry eyed about our own definition. No doubt it can be improved. No doubt uh, others will come up with an even better definition uh, of ecocide, one that commends itself to states. It's about changing consciousness. It's about recognizing that there are certain lines that cannot be crossed anymore. And it will be ultimately for prosecutors and for judges to determine whether a particular act does or does not cross that line. That is not for us as members of this working group. It will be for others to run with those issues. Uh, another quite detailed, specific question. Would lack of action um, by a government, for instance, or a corporation, rather than actual action, fall under this definition? <laughs> um, Jojo has been very concerned uh, with this issue, and she's been badgering us all. Does our definition include emissions? And um, the definition of an act, in my view, includes a failure to act. Uh, Dior is nodding, I'm going to leave it to her to say more, but it's well established in the criminal law in my country that a failure to act is an act. Dior, en Senegal, est-ce que c'est la même chose? Dans le monde francophone? Dior, is it the same in Senegal or in the French-speaking world? Absolutely. I think this really reflects our definition. So we, we, we talk about emissions, so when measures were not taken to avoid any damages that might have occurred, I think that is part of our definition, yes. Thank you very much there. We are coming to the end now. Um, we have 10 minutes left and we have a few more questions, but I wondered if uh, 
Jojo Dior and Philippe, you wanted to think of some perhaps closing remarks to, to round off this session. Um, let me, before we do that, go to one more question. And I'm juggling here a little between three different. I, I don't think technology. I've ever seen so many questions on a webinar before. We seem to be over 120 questions, which is pretty astonishing in the space of uh, in the space of an hour. <laughs> Thank you it's, all for it's your questions. It's a question. sign of enthusiasm, isn't it? An interest, or a sign of uh, overweening complexity in the subject of ecocide that it gives rise to so many reactions. But it's very encouraging and exciting, I have to say, to see so many questions. A wonderful question. Um, there was one here about Polly Higgins's definition that she'd come up with, obviously, but some years ago, um, and the difference between what she came up with and what you've come up with, um, and which one actually leads to the introduction of the crime of ecocide under the ICC statute. I'm, I'm happy to take that. Um, Yes, Polly, Polly Higgins's definition um, talked about it was effectively loss, damage and destruction um, to ecosystems of a given territory such that the inhabitants or rather the peaceful enjoyment of the inhabitants is severely diminished. So, so her, um, her definition was effectively um, based around inhabitants and um, not just she actually intended that not just to be humans but to be uh, other inhabitants as well um, now I would say that I mean that there were a couple of issues there which didn't perhaps sit so easily into the language and the format of the Rome statute so for example peaceful enjoyment is something that in the UK if you've ever signed a tenancy agreement you you know you know what peaceful enjoyment is it's being allowed to get on with your life as you would normally do it but that concept isn't reflected the same in continental law um, but also um, there's actually in a way the definition that the panel has come up with goes a little bit further because it actually values the ecosystems in and of themselves um, and I believe this is um, you know, a very powerful direction to move in and what's been so incredible about how the panel have brought this together over these you know amazing deliberations and sometimes arguments and and you know looking into you know different aspects is that they have based the definition that's emerged really quite strongly on legal precedent from international criminal law but also from environmental law um, so that although the step that's being taken here is a strong step of moving into a new way of looking at things which Philippe's described very carefully and well um, is also um, very firmly based in legal principles and legal language that is also going to be familiar to states and I think this is one of the the hugely um, it's one of the biggest advantages of this definition. It really stands in its favour, I believe. Um, it's, there's this kind of well-balanced pitch between, you know, what concretely needs to be put in place to protect the future of life on Earth, you know, to, to prevent the most serious, most egregious cases of damage to, to nature, but at the same time be credible and, and um, be taken seriously by the governments that will need to move this forward. And I think that's a phenomenal achievement, I have to say. Um, it, it's been fascinating to watch and you know we're really excited with the result. Um, Dior perhaps I could ask you for some closing thoughts. Um, you spoke so well about the the logistics the diversity of pulling together this team uh, in this very short time and coming up with something that you could all agree on. Um, I wonder how you're feeling now that it's out there in the public and, and what you feel the next steps need to be? I think the fact that we were able to come up with a definition that is balanced, that's very important. And Philip repeated it. It's important to bear in mind that the judge isn't stuck uh, within it. The judge and the prosecutor can appreciate it. And there's a other steps now, which is to ensure to have a follow up, to simplify the definition and explain it so that people can make it theirs. They need to understand the content to know why a certain word was used. And we need 
we made sure that every time, every time could sort of find themselves in this definition. And I think our work now is to continue. I was talking about this battle, like I said, we need to uh, make sure to just continue in that direction for humanity. We mustn't give up. And I think if we continue and be as determined as we've been until now, like we've been when we put together the, de the definition, if we continue with this open mind, being able to explain the definition, I think that we can finally make sure that our dreams come true. And you spoke there about spreading the word uh, about this, and I hope this will be picked up uh, by the media in, in the coming days and months. And I wondered, Jojo, who do you hope is going to be quaking most in their boots uh, at the thought of this becoming uh, on the ICC statute? I, I love this question. People ask this this to us often. They say, "Who you know? Who do you want to see in the dock?" Now, I mean, I, I actually came to this work originally through very on the ground environmental activism in, in the anti fracking community. And if you'd asked me that question a few years ago, I'd have given you a short list. <laughs> but actually, we don't do that anymore. And the reason we don't do that is that the situation that we're facing globally is a it's a, this is a global crisis. Yes, we're all suffering it in different ways and in different degrees, and often that's very unequal. But this is a situation we're facing globally. We can't point over there and say, look, that leak, it's at your end of the boat. I mean, you know, we all sink. Um, and so what this what this requires is for everybody to come with us. So we this is a reason that we um, we recommend a phasing in period. We aim at the international level to create a, 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 a sense that this is something that's coming. We already know. In fact, funnily enough, we spoke with a reinsurance company, one of those big ones, Lloyd's of London or someone a few years ago. And they said, we know this is coming. We just don't know when. So, you know, that sort of sense of, of, of something coming over the horizon is very, very important because it enables those key players in, in politics and in the corporate world to start shifting their attitudes. So our our ideal answer, in fact, to that question is we don't want to see anyone in the dock. You know, we want people, we, we want to, we're putting this in place in order to shift that consciousness, change those attitudes, and to enable the solutions that are already there, you know, to, for, for, for moving towards a, a more thriving and sustainable way of, of, of interacting, of, of, um, of, of a relationship of harmony with nature instead of one of harm, you know, is to enable all of that um, and effectively have people be behaving better and therefore not be heading for that dock. Of course, inevitably, there will be cases that arise, but in, in, in the, perhaps one of the big differences here between, say, climate litigation, which is happening a lot around the world now and you know many hundreds of cases which produces a fantastic bank of evidence it shames companies that are doing the wrong thing and sometimes it even creates compensation but again i come back to the this sort of almost the strategic intervention of the criminal law it's almost like a kind of an acupuncture needle if you like on, on a pressure point you know it's it's it has that way of potentially putting a moral parameter around things that, that enables people to, to sort of say, well, actually, the, to know that, you know, this far and no further. And that's enabling for those that, that do the right thing. And it's, it's, um, it's an additional kind of ground rule that has to be taken into account by those who have not had to up until now. And Philippe, thank you, Jojo. Philippe, a last word from you. Is this, is this that moment, an inflection point post-pandemic? Um, or, or, and I know you've been quite cautious about about the, you know, the fate of this of this uh, draft law. Um, but could this be could this be the moment? Is it is it the insurance industry that will change everything? But something as small as that, or, or is it something that we haven't foreseen yet? You know, in international law, Andrew, you get occasional moments where remarkable things happen. It's not very often. Nineteen forty five was a moment uh, when states came together in the face of a major catastrophe in a crisis and they acted and they changed the world by creating institutions and rules and the idea of the rule of law. There was a moment more recently in 1998, a remarkable summer, the statute of the International Criminal Court was adopted. President Milosevic was indicted secretly for international crimes that had never happened before to a serving head of state and 
Senator Pinochet was arrested in London in a hospital room for crimes against humanity and genocide allegations. And I wonder whether this might be such a moment. I wonder whether the combination of COVID-19 teaching us that we cannot control everything, that there are things that are beyond us in which we need to work collectively and we need to work proactively, coupled with the growing evidence, frankly, of major environmental catastrophe uh, coming, um, might not concentrate minds. I mentioned earlier that I'd been very surprised. I mean, the stream, the steady stream of media requests, I had not expected, you know, I'd do a number of things that are, you know, being on working groups and things. And this has been very different, but there's one thing in particular that makes me think this may be such a moment, um, which in a sense is quite a personal thing. Um, you know, I am fortunate in my life and I get involved in quite a lot of interesting things. And my three wonderful kids, you know, don't pay a lot of interest or attention and quite rightly as younger people just get on with their lives. But when the media picked up that this initiative was underway and that I would have an involvement as a member of the working group, something happened that had never happened before. All three of them separately messaged or WhatsApped me and said, that is great, Dad. That is great that you're finally doing something useful. And I thought that was interesting because that generation is key. And if we can galvanize the interest of that generation in this project, it will happen. And I think it will force states to recognize the existing arrangements are not enough and we need more. And this is the right direction. It may not be the perfect text. No doubt states will want to make improvements to it but it opens the door to change and to a recognition that the situation we are in today is intolerable and something has to change. And let us work with the next generations in making this happen. They are the key to change and we must support them. And I just wanna say thank you to you, Andrew, for your personal interest in supporting this. It means a lot to me uh, that you have uh, been so engaged with us in helping to reach that broader, younger, wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philippe. And thank you, Jojo and Dior. It's been an absolute pleasure. I hope we can put this on YouTube, Instagram, uh, wherever else we can spread the word. Um, absolutely fascinating hour and a, a little um, conversation. So thank you all. And um, I can see we've had 300 plus participants uh, and such an important issue and so much progress these past six months. So uh, let's hope that the, the momentum continues. Uh, just thank you so much for, for having me on board this in a small way. Uh, goodbye to you all.